You have to set up this structure. You have to have everything predictable and consistent. As you're developing some rules, you have to create and develop the rules with them. And each rule you develop, you have to make sure you talk about why that rule is important. Welcome to the Honestly Adoption Podcast, a show about adoption, foster care, advocacy, and becoming the best caregiver possible. Pull up a chair. We're glad you've joined us. Here's your host, Mike Berry. Friends, welcome back to the Honestly Adoption Podcast. We are so glad you're joining us from wherever in the world you're joining us. We are kicking off a brand new season. We're in season 27. Wow, that's just amazing that we have already produced 27 seasons of this show. And uh, you're joining us for episode 236. If this is your first time joining us, you can always visit honestlyadoption.com slash podcast to get caught up on past episodes, past seasons, and also browse uh, the resources that we create at the Honestly Adoption Company. We're all about helping you become the best caregiver possible. So we have loads of uh, resources over at honestlyadoption.com. Here's what we're doing for uh, the beginning of this brand new season. Uh, We're airing a special four-part series called uh, FASD Expert Spotlight. Here's why we're doing that. Uh, Back about a month, month and a half ago, we aired an episode uh, with our good friend Susan Ellsworth from the Indiana Alliance for Prenatal Substance Exposure. And since then, we've received a lot of questions. Uh, In fact, uh, fetal alcohol spectrum disorders always gets a lot of questions. Uh, There's a lot of mystery around it, and we are thankful uh, to be partnered with some world-renowned experts who uh, are leading voices, uh, thought leaders, trainers, teachers, uh, when it comes to uh, understanding fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, but also helping you, the caregiver, uh, become the best caregiver possible for your child. Uh, And that begins by understanding. And so for the next four weeks, we are uh, airing this special series called FASD Expert Spotlight. And we're going to air some interviews that we did uh, on uh, on some podcasts and then also some interviews that we shared on our personal podcast. So you're going to hear um, some, not only you're gonna hear, are you going to hear some really great conversations, but we're also going to be sharing and pointing you towards uh, some really valuable podcasts um, from some amazing leaders in the FASD uh, community. So we're excited to air that. In this very first episode, we're sharing a previously unreleased recording, uh, actually unpublished recording, at least for this podcast, that I did uh, a, a couple of years ago with Dr. Ira Chasnoff, uh, who is a good friend of ours, but also world-renowned, probably the world-renowned expert when it comes to um, fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. And we had a discussion about the online world and FASDs. How do you navigate the online world, which is already, we know, a vortex, a vacuum? Um, How do you navigate that with uh, uh, children, with people who um, who have a a fetal, an FASD? And uh, I mean, it's it was a great conversation. You will love this conversation I had with Dr. Chasnov. He is a wealth of knowledge. Um, This interview was was just it, it it to I couldn't write notes fast enough as a caregiver. Um, so you're going to love it, and uh, it, it, it really answers a lot of questions that we as caregivers are dealing with when it comes to this, this current culture, this current uh, uh, world when it comes to uh, the internet and internet safety and all of that. Uh, we also talked a little bit about his book, um, FASDs and the Online World. And uh, we'll link all of that in the show notes. Uh, You don't have to worry about uh, keeping up with me. Um, You can click the show notes and the links will be there. But listen, we are glad you're joining us. Um, And if you are brand new to the show, again, like I said, welcome to you. Make sure you jump over to our podcast website, honestlyadoption.com slash podcast, and get caught up on our resources, past episodes, all of that. And hey, listen. Jump over to Apple Podcasts. Jump over to Stitcher, Spotify, Google uh, Podcasts. All over, we're all over the place. Leave us a review. Uh, tell us what you think of the show. Uh, we would love that. That helps. Uh, that just pushes those algorithms into the stratosphere and gets this show out to more people. Guys, thanks for being here. And now on with my interview with Dr. Ira Chasnoff. 
welcome back uh, a very dear friend of mine uh, that we have done a lot of uh, interviews together over the years, Dr. Ira Chasnoff from NTI Upstream. Uh, and today we're in this particular interview, we're going to be talking about uh, a very interesting topic and that is fetal alcohol spectrum disorders in the online world, which is also the title of his latest book, FASD in the Online World. So Ira, welcome back. Thanks. It's always, uh, it's always fun talking with you. Yeah. And actually, this is a topic that I've been excited to talk to you about uh, really since I heard about uh, your latest book, FASD in the Online World. Uh, and so I really want to start right out of the gate. Uh, you know, on, on these interviews in particular, we've talked about FASDs with you. I've had that conversation with you and helping parents uh, formulate strategies to, to better parent their children. And then I've also had experts talk about internet safety and the online world, but now we're blending these two topics together. So um, why, why are these two topics, FASD and the online world, in tandem, why are they so important? Well, uh, because both, you know, the common denominator between FASD and the internet, especially social media, uh, the common denominator is the brain. Uh, and uh, much, many of you, members of your audience have heard me talk about the effects of alcohol on the developing fetal brain. Uh, and then we're going to, as we talk today, we're going to pair that against the brain basis of uh, social media and how it was designed. Uh, and that's, that's the common thread. It all comes down to the brain. Yes. And, and we were talking offline. I really want you to get into this. Um, we were talking, you, you, you talked about, um, you, you know, the um, brain functionality, the, what I would call the pleasure center. Um, that's not the official term for it, but um, we were talking about that and you talk, you, you were mentioning how the developers of social media, uh, how they have uh, become successful or or the online space in particular has become so successful. So let's get into that a little bit um, because I think what you said was really intriguing to me and I was feverishly scratching out notes here, um, but I'll just let you explain. I'm going to step out of the way and let you explain that sure. because I think that's a really fascinating thing for parents to hear. Okay. When it comes to the brain for all of us, but especially for teenagers, just adolescents in general, the two key brain functions that propel online use are pleasure and relationships. Now, pleasure, uh, the, the, the part of the brain responsible for making us feel good about things, to feel pleasure, is called the prefrontal cortex. And it's way up in the front part of the brain, and it releases, uh, uh, it releases dopamine. Dopamine is the pleasure center of the brain. And so anything you can do that releases dopamine gives you pleasure. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the other aspect of brain functioning that's important uh, for all of us, but especially for adolescents, is relationships. You know, we as humans are always looking for connections. And uh, one of the main hormones produced by the brain, and this is produced by the midsection of the brain, uh, called the hypothalamus, uh, but the hypothalamus produces oxytocin. And oxytocin is the cuddle hormone. Uh, it's what makes you want to connect to people. And when you do connect to people, more oxytocin flows. So how are those affected, those two centers of the brain, affected by prenatal alcohol exposure? That's the first question. So the difficulty when alcohol is used by the pregnant woman, especially early in pregnancy, often before she even knows she's pregnant, um, it, it, its main target is the uh, limbic system, the midsection of the brain. And the limbic system is kind of at the core in that it transmits information that we receive from the environment. It transmits information up to the prefrontal cortex, as well as the limbic system uh, contains organs on its own. So in short, the way alcohol affects this process, uh, the first is it affects the limbic systems. Alcohol use early in pregnancy can affect the limbic system's ability to transmit information, to get information up to that prefrontal cortex in order for dopamine to flow, for dopamine to be released. So 
it uh, disrupts, it, it takes more stimulation to get that pleasure center fired off. The second thing is it affects the limbic system directly, especially what we're talking about today, the hypothalamus. So it can affect the release of oxytocin. Now, what does that come down to? In order to, to get dopamine released, the adolescent with FASD ha is looking for significant um, information from the environment. Uh, so that that information can be fed up to the prefrontal cortex. And in addition, is looking, the adolescent is looking for relationships. Mm -hmm. Now, the adolescent, I'm sorry, I'm stumbling here. That's okay. Um, so now we have to talk about, well, how does, how does alcohol exposure affect relationships? And I think this comes down to the issue of communication. So think about communication now. What is communication? Um, there are three components to expressing ourselves verbally. One is speech. And speech is the actual sound that we make. It's, it's the words, the spoken language we use. Uh, the next step is language itself which is a whole system of, of verbal information and symbols. And so it's written, uh, but uh, language also includes reading uh, body cues, facial cues, body language. So that's part of language, is not only being able to produce sounds in a coherent way, but also to read information that's coming back in response to those sounds you're making. Communication then, is the process of transferring all of this information so that the individual can use it and respond appropriately. Mm. So there's speech, there's language, and then there's putting it all together. And that's where teens with FASD really have difficulty. Uh, this is called adaptive functioning. The ability to take what you know and utilize it in the fulfillment of daily tasks. So communication is, uh, for example, uh, knowing when you're talking to someone what distance to keep so that uh, you don't walk up to somebody and invade their space. Mm -hmm. Communication is all about understanding sarcasm and uh, being able to understand uh, uh, symbolism. So one of the examples I always use uh, is a young lady that we were working with uh, when we were making our film Moment to Moment about uh, young adults with FASDs. Uh, our film crew was out uh, filming in her home one morning uh, and before school. And then the film crew started packing up and they said, okay, we'll be back at two o'clock to film some more. And this young lady who's 22 years old has an IQ of 125 said two o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the afternoon. Now, one would think, oh, she's a teenager, you know, she's, she's being sarcastic, she's just, but it's, this is actually a very real question for her because what parents often talk about common sense, mm -hmm. teens with FASD lack common sense. And that's all part of communication, taking speech, language, combining it for our communication system. Now think about the teen with FASD who's having trouble in their peer relationships. For example, the young lady I'm talking about, her friends say, uh, let's get together at four o'clock uh, and uh, we'll, we'll have a, a, study, a study break together. And this young lady says four o'clock in the morning or four o'clock in the afternoon. Now her peers might laugh that first time and say, oh, you're such a card, of course, you know, we're gonna meet at four o'clock in the afternoon. They'll brush it off. But the next time she now becomes weird. And that's, yeah. these issues in communication are one of the difficulties the teen have in keeping social relationships. So think about the teen now with FASD. Uh, online, they don't have to worry about understanding sarcasm. 
They don't have to understand uh, social distance. They don't have to read facial expression. They don't have to read body language. It's all right there in black and white, right on the screen. Yeah. Now that's the advantage and that's why they feel so much more comfortable. It has a flip side though. There, you know, teens will express sarcasm. They will on online. Uh, they will make uh, outlandish jokes online. But the teen with FASD is going to take that information literally. They don't know how to walk that gray back and forth. Everything is black and white. Mm -hmm. And that's why they are so susceptible to uh, being victims online. It's also why they're so susceptible to being perpetrators online because mm. they don't quite understand the meaning of their words. So communication is all one area. Yeah. Did you want to ask a question now? Because I well, to go to something. Yeah, yeah. Um, hold that thought because the big question I have, um, we're taught as as you mentioned a little while ago, um, those interpersonal relationships. And I think this pretty much goes along with the communication and the interpersonal relationships. I'm thinking about several of our clients who have come to us over the last several months and said, I, my child just does wildly inappropriate things in relationships. Um, has one person in particular uh, talked about their teenage son who uh, could basically could not handle himself out in the neighborhood um, could not handle himself over using a cell phone or over social media. It was almost like there was a, it was a, it was, it was a social disconnect. So the, my question is, how do you, okay, how do we as parents, because I, because I, when I'm parenting a child like this too, how do we as parents, um, how do, I don't even know how to ask this question. It's such a big question. Like, how do we, help our children who have FAS, who have an F FASD, how do we help them make those appropriate social connections or help or explain to them when there is a social disconnect that they're not understanding? That's a huge question, I know. Uh, that might be a whole different discussion. Uh, but let me, let me try to just answer that relatively briefly. Uh, you, as a parent of a child with FASD, you are going to spend your life being their external brain. And it may be they're never going to be able to get out socially independently. Now, the, that's the bad news. The good news is, is that the prefrontal cortex that helps govern a lot of this uh, does reach full maturity by about well, the late 20s, so between 26 and 30 years of age. So we do see a change in a lot of the children with FASD around ages 26 to 30 years because the prefrontal cortex is coming into play now. So the prefrontal cortex, the dopamine, actually has two roles. And I didn't mention this earlier because I didn't want to get this too confusing, but I, you have forced me to now, so I will do it. The other role of the prefrontal cortex is regulation. It's the regulatory center of the brain. So that's connecting consequences with behavior. That's decision making. And we were going to get into this in just a moment. But um, so I'll just give you a, an easy example. Many of our kids with FASD get treated for uh, ADHD. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, in fact, do have ADHD. You know, didn't you see the car coming? And they yes, saw the car coming. I just didn't think it would get there the same time I would. So I went for it. Now, what they're telling you is that they saw the car, but in order to get that image up to the prefrontal cortex, that information has to pass through the limbic system. Yeah. And if there is damage to the limbic system, that information isn't getting up there. So you don't regulate your behavior. So the other aspect of all of this, as we talk about how do we manage our kids online, the other aspect is we have to be, have a very clear structure and guidance 
for uh, internet use. Yeah. Into our specific topic today. Now, uh, how do we teach them socially? Uh, that's a whole other big issue, and yeah. I'm not sure we have time to get to that today. <laughs> we'll have to we'll have to definitely uh, schedule another okay. another follow up yeah. conversation. Like, be- I'm thinking, man, that is a whole other topic. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. continue. Yeah. But um, there's no easy answer for that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so let me go back. Let me get back on track here. So let's talk about now the three factors we've talked about that are important in, uh, in, in understanding internet, especially social media use and misuse by teens with FASD. Number one, they want relationships. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they're looking for relationships. Number two, they're seeking pleasure, they're seeking rewards. And number three, they have very poor regulatory behaviors. Mm -hmm. So decision-making, understanding the consequences of what they do on the internet, um, it's just not there. Uh, And even if you try to lecture them and teach them and say, if you, say, come over to my house to a stranger and give them your address. If you tell them, don't do that because a stranger is going to show up at our house and may harm us, connecting the action with the consequence doesn't necessarily work. So that's number one, the regulation problems. Number two, as I said, they're looking for relationships. They are human just like all of us. Mm -hmm. And they have this need for relationships. And, you know, finding relationships on the internet, it's just just so much easier for these young people. Mm -hmm. And then number three, they're looking for rewards. They're looking for pleasure. So if somebody likes them, if somebody uh, uh, gives them positive feedback online, then that's going to trigger those dopamine receptors that they have trouble triggering and it's going to feel good. And it's yeah. the same thing with, um, with any kind of reward system. Now the developers of the internet, especially the developers of uh, social media knew this, not just for um, uh, teens and not just for young people with FASD, but for all of us. Yeah. So they created what is known in the business as the compulsion loop. And the compulsion loop is the design of social media to stimulate oxytocin and dopamine because the developers of social media know that if they can stimulate oxytocin and dopamine, they can promote ongoing online activity. And the more online activity they have, of course, the more they make in ad sales. Sure. For that particular, so that's how they get us hooked. Um, and I've been talking a lot about social media, but the other aspect of this is gaming. Mm. And this is just like going to Las Vegas. And if you've ever done the slot machines, the slot machines are designed to be random. Because what research has shown, and this goes all the way back to Skinner, back in the 1930s, wrote about this. Um, If you reward someone every time they try a task, it's not as effective as randomly rewarding them. So in other words, when you pull the lever on the slot machine, and you, what you get is a burst of dopamine waiting to see if you get the reward. And if it doesn't line up, you know, the three jackpots, then the dopamine falls. But you still got that powerful cue, that powerful dopamine surge just by trying. And you do it again and again until you actually get the jackpot lined up. And what happens is you get not only the, the, when you pull the lever, you get that dopamine excitement, but then when you get the reward, you get even either you get even a higher stimulation of dopamine. And so that's the way games are designed online. They make it difficult enough that you're seeking and you keep seeking uh, positive reinforcement by doing something 
And what does that do? That drives you compulsively to keep going. So that's why our teens are with FASD are so susceptible. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying this interview with my good friend, Dr. Ira Chasnoff. Listen, I wanted to jump in here real quick and uh, basically shout out to all of my foster adoptive dads who are listening, or if you are a spouse and you are married to or connected to uh, or friends with a foster adoptive dad, I'm also shouting out to you. Join us, dads, join us for Road Trip 2022 he, uh, in the mountains of Colorado Springs this coming fall, uh, October 3rd through the 5th, 5th through the 8th. It's going to be an amazing time. It's, a, it's, it's basically three days of conversation, getaway, adventure designed by foster adoptive dads for foster adoptive dads. You can learn more at roadtripdads.com. And listen, right now, when you register for Road Trip, we are giving away some really special bonuses. In fact, we've never given away bonuses when you register for Road Trip. And right now, until uh, September 1st, we are giving away uh, access to Trauma Knowledge Masterclass, our uh, our uh, premier course on understanding trauma, disrupted attachment, behavior response. We're giving free access to that, free Oasis community for a year, and a signed copy of our book, Securely Attached. You get all of it. It's a $637 value when you register for Road Trip by September 1st. That's right. September 1st is coming up in just a little over a month. Um, You don't want to miss this uh, exclusive bonus opportunity. We've never given away bonuses uh, when you sign up for Road Trip, but we're doing this now, and we're giving away, man, some amazing bonuses. So don't miss out on your opportunity. Visit RoadTripDads.com to save your spot today. And listen, if you are a spouse and you know your guy needs to get to the mountains of Colorado, sign him up. Sign him up. We've had lots of spouses do that over the years. And listen... There's never been any regrets uh, for coming up the mountain and hanging out with us for a couple of days. Again, that's roadtripdads.com. And now back to the show. Tell me if how this lines up, but I'm thinking about the child who um, continues to pursue those relationships that are toxic. So we're, we're bringing it back into the physical real world. So the child with an FASD who, who pursues the, the relationships that are toxic, um, and, I, and, I, and I'm using that actually a real life example, just as you talk about like how game systems and how the online world is, they've designed it to not always reward, you know, and there's a lot of different examples I could use there, but I'm thinking about it this in more of like the physical real life world that our kids live in with the relationships that they, yeah. they pursue that may, you know, it's the, it's the kid in the neighborhood who may like throw them a bone and hang out with them for a while, but then the next five or six days totally reject them. And all the while parents are standing by saying they, that person doesn't want to be friends with you. Oh yes, they do mom yeah. and dad. Yes, they do. And it's almost, it almost, I don't know if this is a question, just a statement, but it almost it translates over to the same thing that happens on in the online world where five days in a row, this, our, our child is being rejected by this kid in the neighborhood, keeps pursuing, keeps pursuing, keeps pursuing. And then there's that one day where that child may be bored or whatever it is and decide to throw our kid a bone and hang out with him. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't really know what the question is there, but it is, I, know. Is, I know okay. what the yeah. is. I'll, I'll, then I'll let you take it right there. You make sense out of my madness. <laughs> okay. Your question really is about toxic relationships. Okay. And- and to answer this, I think I would give you an example that moves away from teens and moves away from FASD. And let's just look at the issue of domestic violence. Okay. People always ask, why do women stay with someone who's beating them? And you, if you examine these relationships, what you find is that they can be treated, the, the woman can be treated horribly, uh, both physically and emotionally. But then there are those occasional random times when there is a loving relationship, usually with adults in this situation expressed through sexuality. So the looking, so, so 
the the battered woman sticks with her um, perpetrator uh, because she's looking for those instances in which she really does feel loved. And then oxytocin flows, uh, the dopamine flows, and it makes up for all the bad times. And so this is the compulsion loop. You can apply this idea of the compulsion loop to just about anybody. Now, we're bringing it back to our teens with FASD, they don't often, we, they don't, because they don't understand sarcasm, they don't understand often, they can't read anger, they can't read hostility, they only hear the words. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll give you another example. I had a young lady that was expelled from school. She was one of our patients and uh, she's 14 and she was expelled from school for starting a fight. And here's literally what happened. She was talking to her friend um, at school, another girl, same age, and they were just talking and the young lady, uh, I'll make up a name just so uh, make it uh, Sarah. So Sarah uh, was talking with her friend and Sarah said something, and her friend said, oh, you're bad. Now, in the language of teens, bad means good. You yeah. know, that's a sign, oh, you're bad. But Sarah didn't take it that way. Her good friend was telling her she was bad, and so Sarah hauled off and slugged her. <laughs> and so, and then, of course, they got into a fight. Sarah had started it, and Sarah was expelled. And it's that same thing. Uh, they, they just hear the words. And uh, often even they hear selective words. Uh, and so they get themselves into situations. The most difficult cases that are brought to me are cases either via the internet or uh, in-person kinds of cases, you know, uh, where it's hard to tell if the young person with FASD who got into an inappropriate sexual relationship, it's a fine line between being the victim and the perpetrator. And our kids with FASD don't know how to walk a fine line. So we end up in court uh, trying to help the court walk the fine line and understand uh, the thinking of this young person uh, before the judge. Yeah. And I, I can, you know, we, we try to be personal um, with our own story, with our, our members and our audience and everything. And I can say that what you just said, we are smack in the middle of personally with, with one of our children. And, it, and it's very, very difficult. You know, I, I think where we've been as parents and, and where a lot of our parents are is, is we have the child who is, is in that compulsion loop. We have the child who's who has no social awareness. Um, talking about boundaries, or talking about what does a parent do with the the compulsion loop? What does a parent do with the child who is so obsessed with the online, with with Snapchat or TikTok or all these other uh, areas that kids are are into, or gaming? We have we have some serious gamers who would stay on video games all day long. So where, how does a parent step into that and how, and what, what do, what do healthy boundaries look like? You know, what what do we need to do to create healthy boundaries? Okay. So here's where we get into the topic of how do we protect our teens? Where do we start? Yeah. Uh, Let me say, first of all, although this is, we're talking about protecting teens, it has to start long before uh, the teenage years. Mm -hmm. And I encourage parents to start setting up their rules and guidelines for their home and for their teens use, uh, by eight or nine years of age. If you start, then it's going to be much easier as the child gets older. But given that many families are already in the teen years and facing these problems, uh, you know, these strategies I'm going to talk about, um, will, will will work uh, also they're just harder to implement okay so how do we set up guidelines and a structure for our for our teens uh, regarding the use of the internet first of all all teens and especially those with fasds need three basic elements from their parents structure predictability and consistency 
So you have to develop a structure so that the child knows what to expect, so that it is then very predictable and consistent. If you vary from this structure you set up, you're asking for trouble. Mm -hmm. And I have parents that are very well-meaning. Uh, I'll go back to our film moment to moment. Uh, one of the scenes in the film is our young lady. Uh, her name is Kara. So Kara, uh, remember, is 22 years old, has an IQ of 125, is in her second year of college, living at home with her mother and younger sister. Uh, Kara does, in fact, have, uh, it falls within the FASD spectrum. And there's a scene where Kara is just falling apart. She, you know, earlier in the movie, she's talking and she's, she's a, a lovely young lady and, and very verbal and, and bright. But then there's a scene where she's just falling apart and crying and the mother can't console her and can't figure out what's going on. Well, what had happened is uh, Kara's mother is very, it, it, she's been working with us since Kara was about three years old. Uh, so she has taken all of our guidance and guidelines and has really structured her home. And her stru uh, so one of the things she's done is she created a calendar. And so every activity of the family for each month is on that calendar. And if you look at the Fridays, every Friday, Kara, her sister, and her mother go for ice cream. And that's on the calendar every Friday. Well, it happened that... Uh, Kara came home on a Thursday and found out that her mother and younger sister had gone for ice cream because the younger sister had accomplished something important at school. I forget what it is, but something really good had happened. When Kara found out, she absolutely fell apart. Not because she didn't get ice cream. That had nothing to do with it. It's because they went for ice cream on a Thursday instead of a Friday because they were going to go the next day. Kara would get her ice cream. But mm -hmm. That's how this is kind of a two-edged sword. And so you have to set up this structure. You have to have everything predictable and consistent. As you're developing some rules, uh, there's a process. Uh, you have to, especially if your child's already in the teen years, you have to create and develop the rules with them. And each rule you develop, uh, you have to make sure you talk about why that rule is important. Now, will the child uh, retain that information? Probably not. But you have to have that discussion constantly. Make sure the rules are serve a purpose. Uh, you don't want any more than, at the very most, six rules. And they have to be stated very clearly and specifically and concretely. Um, you can't say, for example, no internet use before dinner. That doesn't mean anything to a child uh, with FASDs. You have to say, here are the hours that you may use mm -hmm. the internet. Okay? Um, the rules should be stated in positive terms. Uh, don't say, uh, do not, uh, I'm trying to think of something, uh, do not use the internet after 7 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Rather, you have to say, you may use the internet between five and seven o'clock. Mm -hmm. So see how that's stated in positive yeah. terms. Um, the rules have to be relatable to what goes on, very real about what happens in your family. So for instance, using this time example again, if you have dinner every night at six o'clock, then you have to decide where internet use figures in. And you have to keep going over the rules on a regular basis. Um, and it's not a bad idea when you're starting out uh, that uh, if you say, for example, uh, internet use uh, is between uh, 4.30 and uh, 6, and then 7 and 8, every time the child goes to use the internet, you need to reinforce the rule. Right. Oh, Susan, I'm really glad. And it has to be positive. Positive mm -hmm. reinforcement is the only thing that works. Susan, I'm really glad I see that you're using the internet between 4.30 and 6. So, and you have to just keep going on and on. 
Now, this next one uh, is really important, and parents uh, start laughing when I talk about this. And as I wrote the book, I imagined the parent kind of putting the book down and saying, yikes, uh, because <laughs> before you can uh, develop rules for your teen, you need to audit your own use of technology. You need to think about it. Uh, and so, you know, are you using your, let's just take your cell phone. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna ask you, if I, here's a few questions, Mike, you can answer these or not. Uh, and I'm hoping our parents at home that are listening to this can answer. So here are some questions for you. Mm -hmm. Do you feel a mild state of panic if you've lost your phone? Yes, I do. Okay. <laughs> uh, in a national study, 73% of adults say yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, here's another question. Do you spend an average of two to four hours a day tapping, typing, swiping on your device? I do. And part, part of that is that I run an online company, but the other part is uh, I do it even outside of the work hours. So yes. <laughs> okay. See, those two to four hours. Yeah. You're, you're touching your phone 2,600 times. Wow. Um, here's another one. Do you, do you ever feel your phone vibrating in your pocket even when it's not there? All the time. All the I time. Know. Yeah. Amazing, isn't it? it really and is. This is, you know, the great majority of adults say yes. Yeah. And do you wish you spent less time on your phone, but find it, it's just really difficult to disconnect? I absolutely do. You know, I, I have these delusions of grandeur, like when Christmas break gets here, I'm going to turn all technology off. It's not going to mm -hmm. happen. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Well, it's, uh, that's why you've got to, you've got to set some rules for yourself. Yeah. And all parents need to do this. Um, and it's not easy. Now, the question I just asked you are when we talk about internet addiction. Now, you know, there's not a clear definition of internet addiction just yet. But these questions, the studies that develop these questions, these are the kind of questions we're asking people to try to start understanding uh, addiction to cell phones. Mm -hmm. uh, the great majority of adults answer yes to all of these questions. Yeah. And we are what's known as technology naive. And, um, but still, we are addicted to our phones. So the question comes up now, okay, how do we, uh, how do we develop a plan for management of online access for our teams? The first thing we have to do is provide a structure. As, and, and the three elements you want to look at when you're providing structure for online use are place, time, and device. So think about where in your home will you allow access online. You do not want to set up a computer or a laptop in the child's bedroom yeah. where they can close the door. What are the times? We talked about time, how you fit it in and decide uh, and not only the time, the specific times, but how that time is to be used. So part of the time is set aside for homework and part of the time is for games or pleasure, connection, social media, et cetera. And then the difficult thing for us to understand as, um, as technology naive adults is device. Uh, there are so many devices out there now and we're going to have to develop this structure so that not only do we have the place and time, but what device may be used in that specific place and specific time. So those are the three things you have to think about for structure. Um, I kind of laugh, I, I've gone, now I, of course, didn't, go, my, my sons are all in their 40s, so uh, we didn't have this when they were growing up, thank goodness. But my grandchildren, certainly, um, I have two of my granddaughters are 18 years old. And so when uh, they turned uh, 13, they got to get an email account. 
And so, of course, Grandpa, I got an email account, too, uh, because I could watch and see what was going on in their lives. And I, I had open access to their email accounts. And then after about a year or so, it ju they just disappeared. And so I saw them. I said, I don't see you on email anymore. Did, you don't use email anymore? And they just looked at me. They said, email? <laughs> Nobody uses email. And of course, it's Snapchat and Instagram and all these Tick, other things. TikTok, I don't even... yeah. TikTok yeah. is the latest one. That's, yeah. TikTok is one I really don't understand because it is, first of all, I can say this because it's all parents that watch this, but it is, it is probably the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. It's just yeah. videos of themselves. But yeah, I, as you were saying that, I'm like, oh, I know where this is going. Yeah. Email, email is outdated. Yeah. Yeah. And so then, of course, when I said, oh, great, I'll just join. Oh, they said, oh, no, no, Grandpa. You're not getting into our. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, I leave it to their parents then. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll be quite honest. I would not want to be raising children right now. Uh, I think it was much easier in my day. Now, I, I know I sound like a boomer. I apologize. No, but. you know, it, you don't. I, I, I'm not, I'm, I agree with you completely. One of the things that we have, have actually discovered, uh, myself and Kristen, as we are raising, we have two senior daughters uh, who are about to graduate high school. And as I look at teenagers that, and I've raised many teenagers now, and versus little kids, younger kids, younger than like 10 years old, my goodness, it was so much easier to raise little kids than it was to raise teenagers because things change so fast. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're exhausted trying to keep up with the technology and we have to, because we have, we're parents, number one, but number two, we, you know, we're researchers and we're trainers. So we have to always be keeping up with trends and it is actually taking the life out of us at times. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, you're right. I agree with you completely. This is an exhausting generation. Yeah. To, uh, to raise teenagers. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so the next step after you've established the structure, you have to monitor. And when you monitor, it has to be all devices and all accounts. And in order to do that, you must know all the screen names and passwords for every one of your team's accounts. And as you monitor all these devices, if you find an account that you don't have access to, that's an immediate grounds for shutting down all accounts. You have to be very clear about this. Now, most parents tell me, I don't have time to keep checking on my team. And so, uh, you know, how often do I have to do it? And, you know, how, how do I just do this practically? Well, um, if you tell your team, I'm going to check your accounts, all of your accounts every Wednesday, I can assure you every Tuesday night, your team will go online and erase all of his histories. And so you're not going to be able to look uh, to see where your team has been exploring online. So there's something we call the bogus pipeline. And this is really the best way to do it for busy parents. You tell your team, I'm going to check your accounts, every one of your accounts, once a week. And it can be on any day of the week but I'm not gonna tell you which day. So some weeks you check all the accounts on Monday, some weeks on Thursdays, but you vary it and you keep it random. And that's the best way to keep your teen honest. So the frequency, frequency is once a week through a bogus pipeline approach. Secondly, the extent, let them know you're going, you're going to uh, search everything. You're going to go into every account, and if you find any accounts for which you do not have access, then everything's getting shut down. And then the expectations. And this is pretty important. What sites do you allow? And what sites do you not allow? And of course, there's all sorts of software now that you can block a lot of sites. But yeah. let me tell you, teens, even teens with FASDs, know how to get around that software. And so true. So, uh, you know, uh, you have to let them know you expect to see everything all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I am absolutely 100% agree with you. It, it I, I, in fact, I said this um, recently to my son who has an FASD. He, he referred to himself as stupid. <laughs> and I said, Oh buddy, uh, <laughs> you are not, you are not stupid. 
Um, and I can, and I, I proceeded to tell him all the things, all the sneaky things he's done that takes a very, very sharp mind. <laughs> so I completely yeah. agree with you on that. Yeah, yeah. That's really, really good advice. Really good advice. Yeah. Um, then, uh, Another point is you've got to communicate your expe expectations to other parents. Now, yeah. uh, I was, I share things about my family too. I was babysitting my grandchildren, uh, the four oldest ones, and the oldest girls uh, at the who are 18 now at the time were just turning 13. And uh, my son and his wife don't even have a TV in their home but they had access, you know, so we would watch online, we would watch movies uh, through, you know, Amazon, through the streaming and all that. Yeah. Kind of stuff. So I was staying with the four kids for a week, uh, which is a whole other story, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> see all the gray hair, uh, yeah. that's where it comes from. Uh, so we have a lovely time. They're wonderful kids, but my two, the 13 year old girls, they're twins. To my mind as a grandparent, were completely inappropriate. Now, you know, they probably weren't, but they were a little too suggestive for me. Yeah. And I was shocked. I said, where in the world did you see that? You don't even have TV. And they said, oh, we go to our friend's house. We watch MTV. So, you know, you've got to let other parents know what you expect and be very clear. Yeah. And if other parents don't agree to your expectations, then your kids aren't going over to their house. Yeah. It's just like gun safety. It's like drugs in the home. It's like any other risk factor. You have to be very clear as to your expectations. Yeah. Uh, you know, we talked about this just recently. You know, I said, well, they've got two younger siblings. And I said, you know, how do we, what has been your experience? How do you make decisions as to what's right and what's wrong? And uh, they said, it was, they said very clearly, it's what our parents expected. So as a parent, even with of a parent with FASDs, you will be able to communicate through example and through actions more than words, your expectations around sexuality, morality, ethical behavior. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Uh, such great stuff. Uh, I, we could go on. <laughs> I could, I could go, I could have you continue to teach and maybe I, it, as I'm thinking, I'm like, we, I think we need to, create a different space where we, uh, we have a longer presentation on all this, because I think this is really, really fascinating, uh, information for parents. Um, because I'm sitting here, I, you should see my notes right here as I've, as I've been listening to you, um, feverishly scratching things down, uh, trying to keep up, um, because it, it really is even as, even in the time between recording this and releasing this, the technology will advance. Yeah. That's the hard part. But uh, I, I, man, thank you so much uh, well. for, for taking time to do this. Uh, you know, out of respect for our members' time, for your time. Um, unfortunately, we have to cut it short, but or we have to stop. But uh, I, I, I actually I covered everything. Now there's a lot more. There's a lot more detail in the book. Sure. And yeah. uh, and a lot there's like several pages of of guidelines and rules. Yeah. So yeah. Thank you for listening to the Honestly Adoption Podcast, a resource courtesy of the Honestly Adoption Company. To learn more about us, visit www.honestlyadoption.com.